Trip, thank you. Always, every, every time we have a chance to sing praises unto the Lord Jesus Christ and his name, we do it for his glory and for his honor, correct? That was kind of a lead-in to where we're at in the Word of God today, of course. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, we covered 13 verses last time, and we're going to get to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 31, so let's just read it, because this is going to be where we'll be. Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all, go ahead, do all, to the glory of God. Many of you have learned that verse over many, many years. Maybe you've memorized it. You said, hey, of all the verses that I can memorize, boy, I can memorize that one. That's a short one. But with it comes a great deal of accountability and responsibility, and that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at verses 14 down through the end of the passage and cover a little bit of ground, 20-ish verses, and And so we'll have to do a little work here. But I want you to just just stop for a minute and just think of uh, your life in Christ and how one of the earliest things you learned is that you're a new creature, you're a new creation, you're different, and you know you are. When you called on the name of the Lord to save you, when you got saved and you you said, hey, I'm turning from my old turning to this new. I hear that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. We sang about him here. We've had songs and singing. We sing each week. We pray in Jesus' name. And it's okay, okay. One of the first things you learn is that you're a new creature. You are a child of God. You're a son of God. The Bible teaches and your spiritual cutting away, the circumcision, that, hey, you know what? Baptism doesn't save me. Going to church doesn't save me. Uh, Giving money doesn't save me. Being a good person, I can't earn my way to heaven. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you remember, believers in the audience, you know, when you called on the name of the Lord, one of the first things you learned is now, you're going to give glory to God who saved your soul. Didn't you learn that? And say, okay, I've always taken the glory for myself. I've always given myself a pat on the back when I've been wonderful, which is hardly ever anyway. But now I'm going to say, okay, now the Bible says that whatever I drink, whatever I eat, whatsoever I do, do all to the glory of God. How many of you have a cup of coffee right now or something to drink? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Uh, eh, broke the, you're violating. Just kidding. But since you do it for the glory of God, it's okay. So whatever you eat or drink. Now, just think real quick how much I take that for granted. I'm standing up here preaching. I'll pray, God, I want your glory to shine. This is for your glory, whatever I do. But is that just a public statement maybe by me? Maybe maybe sometimes it's just, hey, it sounds good. It's a good preacher speak, message speak. I Well, today I really want to get into what Paul's telling this church. They wrestle with a lot of messed up doctrine. They wrestle with perversion over much. They wrestle with who they follow, whether it's Jesus or someone else. So they've got divisions. They've got issues over, big time over the Lord's Supper. And we'll get into that in chapter number 11, but it's mentioned here in chapter 10. And so Paul keeps on coming with that statement up there that's on the slide, love never fails. He keeps on saying that it's God's love, that he loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son, and now you have this new life, and you're supposed to give glory to God with it. You're supposed to follow after him. You're supposed to become more like Jesus. You're supposed to read the word of God, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So you're supposed to give thanks. You're supposed to pray. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Okay, so I'm going to pray. And I'm going to keep on getting God's direction for my life. Because just as I got saved, according to the word of God, when Jesus said, the only way to get to the Father is through me. And so now my walk with the Lord is through him. It's through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So 
Everything that saved me is now going to take me. The salvation sanctification is now the daily sanctification of my life. And as Paul's teaching the church, once again, we're reminded, hey, it is about my fellowship. It is about my worship. It is about my giving the gospel to everybody. I really desire to do that. In fact, when we started out chapter number 10 last week, I referenced the end of chapter number 9. Paul's words in 927, look there, helps us to escape the strong pull to follow after our flesh when faced with temptation to fall away. Remember last week's message. He said, hey, I'm going to make a way to escape. In fact, the title of the message very simply was His Way of Escape. Because you're going to be drawn by your flesh to be lazy. Drawn by your flesh to do what you want to do instead of what he would have you to do. Drawn by your flesh and your desire to love self more than him to say, okay, God, I'm not going to put myself in subjection to you unless there's something bigger than more important, which is the soul of a lost person. That's what Paul says in verse 27. I keep under my body, it's up on the screen a little bit of it, bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's saying, I don't want to get to a place where I dry up and God just says, I'm going to cast you away. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It means as a castaway, now you're trapped on a desert island and you can't function the way that God would have you to function as a believer because you didn't even take good care of the gospel message that he entrusted you with and he trusted me with. Paul put it out there and said, hey, I warn you, if you don't put God first, if you don't give glory, then there will be temptations that will come and you'll have to make a decision. And even Paul said, hey, in verse number 12, and so we'll put that up there, the Corinthians were warned not to lose their spiritual edge. You're walking with the Lord, you're walking with the Lord. Well, be careful because in 10, 12, we're told about our false sense of self-sufficiency. You ever get to a point where, hey, I've been saved for a while. I know what to do. I know how to do it. I know how to read my Bible and pray every day and grow, grow, grow. So God, truly, I know this walk. I've got this. And Paul's saying, hey, Corinthians, hey, in the Holy Spirit, the word of God speaking to you, believer, and to me, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. It says in Galatians 6, 3, For if any man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Romans 12, 3 says similar things. We've got to be careful that we do not, after a period of time of being saved, born again, new creature, giving glory to God a few times here and there, that now we say, "Ah, I'm going to to put my Christianity on cruise now. And uh, Paul's saying, look out. You may think of yourself a little highly than you ought to. In fact, as the verse says, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth. Take heed lest he fall, because your flesh can take you down in a New York minute. Watch out, I can fall if I have an overconfidence in myself. Even last week when we looked at temptation, we said, hey, watch out. And we said in our invitation time of prayer, Lord, may your word and your warning be our escape once again. God, please, may your word, your precious holy word that warns us, be my escape again. Your warning to take heed lest I fall, may it again put me in that place. But I even went a little further with the bold words at the bottom. It says, God's warnings come with an even bigger priority. It's much bigger. Again, love never fails. God's saying, my word never fails. My love never fails. I'm giving you this. I'm telling you, as it says up in there, hey, all other things will fail, but I won't fail. My love won't fail. And again, back to verse number 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is our bigger priority. This is our upward reflection. This is our upward focus. I need to be focused on giving you glory. And it's so easy to say that I'm going to do that. I mean, just ask yourself, who really gets the glory from what you teach? Who gets the glory for what you talk about? Who gets the glory 
in your prayer life? Who gets the glory in your singing, your fellowship? I'm just talking about the good stuff. Who really, in my life, when I build a relationship, who gets the glory? Well, God built a relationship so he should get the glory. Yes. Do I get the glory for 37 years of marriage? Oh, God, no, I tell you that. Woo. Would you say 54 years? To God be the glory. We say that, don't we? To God be the glory. But is he really the one receiving glory? Is he? That's something for us to really assess this morning in this passage. You see, us as believers are accountable for our walk. Believers are accountable for their walk and their response to God's liberty. That's part of this, again, in the context, in the historical setting of this church in 55, 56, 57 A.D. Hey, you had Paul around for 18 months. He went off to Ephesus. He has to write this letter back, and he said, hey, you are accountable for how you walk and how you respond to God's liberty. Our ability today to enjoy privileges in Christ, Christians, brings with it a weighty responsibility. It's serious. In a good way. Well, you can't smile and laugh. No, you can't. But it's a serious responsibility, especially for spiritual leaders. You say, I'm not a spiritual leader. Well, you're born again, so you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. You are now accountable for your life. You have to lead your own life. God's given you stewardship over that life. You are now a leader over the spiritual life that you have from God. Now you're a spiritual leader and you've been matured, grown a little bit. You know a little bit about the Word of God. You've been saved for 10, 15, 20 years. You're able to teach the Bible. Maybe you're a deacon at a church. Maybe you're an elder. Maybe you are a pastor. Maybe you're a leader of a home as a dad or a mom, and you're saying, okay, as a spiritual leader, I see it. This is a weighty responsibility. And Paul says, hey, church, you're going to be held accountable. So how do you view what God's asking of you? Let me remind you, 1 Corinthians 6 real quick. Paul says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That verse is very similarly spoken in chapter number 10. We'll get there in a little bit. But then it starts talking about edification in verse number 23. We'll get there in a moment. Paul is saying, hey, all things are lawful unto me, and it is understood to be used by those who really sometimes vindicated their vices. See? God's given me everything that I have here. I can do anything I want with it. No, 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 it's true that we're granted liberty in Christ. And we are free from spiritual bondage of the law. But there are people that abuse their liberty in Christ. There are people that say, hey, God made everything for our use, of course, as believers. Therefore, <laughs> you could do anything with them. Absolutely not. You cannot take something that God has meant for good and turn it into evil. God meant the sexual relationship to be between a man and a woman in the confines of a marriage. That's what he meant it for. Man twists that a little bit. We're all a little bit crazy that way. But really, God's way of it is God's way with it. Money. God says, I give you money as an ability to exchange, to compensate someone for something they have done, a good day's work. God says money is a good thing. But the love of money is a place where we can be drawn. It's the root of all evil. Truth. You have all the truth in the Word of God. You got your King James Bible in your lap and you say, I got all the truth I need. What are you doing with that? Are you abusing it? There have been people that have abused the truth of the Word of God and perverted it. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 8, number 8, as why a way of... Uh, Introduction, but when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Remember, when things get all monkeyed up, when they get all messied up in the church, when we go after the things of the flesh and not say, okay, 
God, I realize you've given me a great responsibility. I want to give you glory and honor for everything that I do. It's a lot of work to do so. I'm going to take all that you have given and say, okay, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. They all fit at all times for everything. All things are lawful for me, but I'll be brought under the bondage of any, the power of any. Hey, anything that is of the Lord that he has provided can end up becoming an idol. It can end up becoming a place of sin. When you're more mature in the Lord, you say, okay, I've got a better handle on things. Well, the scripture says, wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, which we covered a few weeks ago, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. That's maturity. Paul realized that some Christians had not yet come to the understanding of these truths. The more mature believers say, hey, I can do what I want. I'm mature in the Lord. <laughs> Tough apples for everybody else. No. No, no, the mature Christian sees, wait a minute, I have this responsibility, and I do not want to become an accessory to a younger believer sinning and falling away. That happens sometimes. We don't even know it or see it, but our testimony or our way of handling things ends up becoming a stumbling block. The scriptures talk about how we don't need to be a stumbling block to a brother. You see, the overwhelming priority for our choices and our actions around fellow Christians and lost souls points upward to the glory of God. Say, of course, pastor, duh. Do all to the glory of God. I've memorized that verse. Is it possible that we treat this incredible command and principle of the word of God as lightly as some of the other things that we do? Is it possible when we say we're going to do all to the glory of God, we don't really put the effort in that we ought to because it takes a lot of effort. I heard this passage of scripture, this verse of scripture, so very much as a young pastor, and it's wonderful. Why are we doing it? What's the purpose? To give glory to God. Whether, therefore, you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Yes. But again, today's passage and today's scripture that we're going to study and look at, I sure hope it reveals to you that it takes a great effort. It takes a great effort to give glory to God. You see, glory to God takes great effort. Perspective, simple. Many of you will watch a football game today, possibly. Some of you have these red colors on and stuff like that. You are going to put a great deal of effort into watching the game. For some of you, you have family over, which I think is awesome. You use it as a time for people to get together, and you love it. You've got food and snacks. Some of you, you're going to, I don't know, Sean, did you, did you make some brisket again? or No? Because uh, I was going to invite the whole church over to your house. But <laughs> Real quick, Sean, if you smoke something, any of you smoke, how long does it take? 10 hours, 12 hours? Do you do all the work or does the machine do the work? But you oversee it. Supervise. Supervise. So the Traeger does a lot of work. Okay. There's a great deal of effort in preparing your fellowship. There's a great deal of effort this evening for all of you to get together. You can invite friends and family. Have a great time. Hallelujah. But who's going to get the glory out of all that? I'm just using it as an example. I'm not... Because whatsoever I eat or drink or whatsoever I do, right? I'm, I'm talking to all of us together. Paul's saying we can let this all slip in some form or fashion as believers that have been saved 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years and say, hey, we give glory to God for everything that we are, everything that we do. He's our purpose. He's our mantra. He is our thinking. It's the scriptures, and that's everything that I do. I do everything for the glory of God. Or do I? So here's just our warning from God. Our challenge from God and our ability in the spirit of God by his word, by his grace, by his truth to respond once again to his teaching of his word. Because it is a serious matter. And it takes a lot of effort to give glory to God. What do you mean? Manipulate 
circumstances, show everybody my nice carnality and religious way. Oh, you're such a good person. I can see by your outward appearance. To give glory to God means a overhaul inside, from the inside out. It means his word has to work in you. It has to dwell in you richly, dwell in me richly. I have to allow him over one year and two years and five years and 20 years and still be tripped up by my own self-sufficiency because oftentimes I don't do things for God's glory. And so Paul's telling the church at Corinth, be careful now, watch out. You're taking the Lord's Supper, but yet you sit at the table of devils and you sit at the table of God. That's quite a conflict here. You are of one body in the blood and the body in the bread in Jesus Christ. You and I are one. Why would I pervert that and take the glory of God away? You have the opportunity to eat or not eat because food is not a problem with God. He doesn't say that any food in the new covenant is a problem to God. So is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the soul of the person that you're with to make of that meal or to partake of that meal more important than your belly and my belly. You see, that's what Paul's doing today. He's showing us in our study today that he wrote almost 2,000 years ago and the Holy Spirit is still working in the word. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let's read our passage. We've got a little work to do, but we're going to walk through it. I've got four little things I want to show you that come together with that title, Glory to God Takes Great Effort. Just like so much of the things that really are worth something, they take great effort. And living glory to God is a spiritual matter for me and for you to give him glory. Let's see what God is showing us in his word. We start off with a, verse number 14. Bam, right there. Boom. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, of course, none of us have any problems with idolatry at all in our lives. No one of us deal with idols. We'll get there in a moment. He continues, verse 15 and on. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Just judge the matter. My words make sense in the spirit of God. Judge the matter. Judge my words. Verse 16, here we go. The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. Is it not that? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Is it not when we come together in communion together to take this communion and take the Lord's Supper? Is it not of the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus? Yes. Verse 17, for we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. We're in one together in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4 tells us of one baptism. One spirit. We are one in Jesus Christ. It says in verse number 18, Behold, Israel after the flesh, being reminded of Israel in their fleshly way, you're converted, you're in Jesus now, but remember, behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar? Ah, the Jews, being reminded of Israel and what they had done in the old way. Remember I spoke last week about God's Incredible track record of being there for Israel. Now here he's just pointing them out again, knowing that there's a bunch of Gentiles here in Corinth. He clears it all up and explains himself here in the next few verses, verse number 19 through 22. What say I then? What do I mean? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Understand, anything. Not anything, anything. Is it that thing that's so important, watch. Verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. He's putting it all on the table, isn't he? It's kind of good. Oh, A plus B equals C. Hang on a minute. He's going to clarify for you in your liberty in Christ where you're supposed to stand and how you handle all this. Verse number 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of the devils. This is a spiritual matter. 
You can't be divided. How long halt ye between two opinions? You can't serve two masters. That's fine. This is a spiritual matter he's bringing to the fore. But sometimes this food that we eat and how we deal with it, as we have looked at in chapter number 6 and some sin there, chapter number 8, chapter number 9, in dealing with sin over whether or not we can eat certain foods or not, Paul has given us clarity here again. Because it must have been an important matter. Why would it be? Because Corinth was a big city that was filled with idol worship. And they had a history. From the Grecian heritage roots to the Roman Empire covering over them to the Jews they could convert that were living there to Jesus Christ. And now they have this whole mess of cultural interaction getting in the way of what is it that pleases the Lord? It's his glory. We've got to do things for his glory. Verse number 20, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? <laughs> it's a spiritual matter. Now here we go, 23 down through 33. All things are lawful for me. I said this was coming again in this different way. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Love the statement. Love the scripture. Not all things edify, but all things edify not. Verse 24, edification must be important. Let no man seek his own will, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat. Asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Sounds like a mission trip, doesn't it, Randy? But if any man say unto you, this is offered as sacrifice unto the idols, eat not for his sake, that showed it. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's putting both statements and both opportunities before you on how you're going to handle this. Follow along. Get the whole text of the passage of Scripture. The sentence started in verse number 28, and it continues down with a question, which is 29. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? I have liberty in Christ to walk through this. If I cause someone else to sin, that is the regulatory thinking that I have to have. But if I'm in this place, by grace, verse 30, for if by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whoa, whoa, I'm free in Christ. As long as I don't cause my brother to stumble. And you may be sitting in the household of a lost person who you want to come to Christ. How do I know the context? Read the rest of the passage with me. Verse 31, 2, and 3. Take them all together. Watch. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God in context of what has been written in verses 28, 29, and 30. Follow in verse 32 and 33. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Oh. How does it end in chapter number nine? What does he say? I put my body in subjection. Why? Because I have to preach the gospel. Verse 23 in chapter number 9 says, This I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker thereof with you. Here we are landing on who's going to get the glory. What's going to be happening here if someone has the ability to hear the gospel without it being infringed upon? Which goes back to our statement of our text today and our message Glory to God takes great effort. It does take great effort. You need to grow in the grace and knowledge. There may be some times where you don't give glory to God where you meant to, and there'll be times where you said, hey, God got the glory out of that, and I didn't even think about it. And that happens sometimes, right? You go, oh, God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. But in the context of what we're dealing with today, historically, in the church of Corinth, they had a lot of stuff to deal with. When you see the conversion of a person 
at a later age who had all kinds of cultural stuff tied together in their background. They might be Italian, they might be Jewish, they might be German, they might be of another religion and background, they might have been a strong Jewish person growing up and then they come to know Jesus, they're a Messianic Jew or how they would be stated, they say, hey, wow, how can I ever eat anything that the Gentiles eat because that means that I would go against God. Because they're thinking Old Covenant. Or I would eat food that was part of a sacrifice that was offered to idols in Corinth that are false gods. And this extra meat that was left over from the sacrifice is at the market and they purchased it to eat it at home. Again, we've been through this a little bit, but where is this really coming to? It's coming to a place of verses 31, 32, and 33 that it takes great effort to give God the glory, but it is what he deserves of a whatever I eat, whatever I drink. It shouldn't be anything other than God and his glory. So let me give you these four things rather quickly, rhythmically. They all fit together as one in our big lesson. The first one is this. Great effort for God's glory means we must flee the idol of self. That's how this started out in verse 14. It means we must flee the idol of self and make worship about him. Where do you get that? Verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. 16. The cup of blessing we bless. It's the communion of the blood of Christ. It's the communion of the body of Christ. Then you go up to Verse number 19, what say I then that the idol is anything or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Would I say that as a believer, I sit at the table of God and then as a believer, I sit at the table of devils, they don't match. You see, I must flee the idol of self because when I idolize myself, I do everything for me. I do what feels good. And sometimes that's okay as long as it doesn't cause you to sin. But sometimes that feeling can lead me to the wrong decision. I must flee the idol of self. It says there, dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Idolatry is a problem. (laughs) Of all the sins, it is the greatest one for each of us. Would you not agree? It's not coincidence that idolatry is forbidden in the first commandment. We know that. Whew. We know that in the pagan world of the Old Testament, the pagan world of Corinth, that there is a whole lot of idolatry going on for the lost, and then they get saved. What do they do? Well, idolatry is still around. What do you do about it? Well, sometimes the idol of self is worse than all that that other idolatry. In fact, let me just just put up on there. 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is an easy one. It's the Old Testament. It's speaking of idolatry. In fact, it's the first mention of Scripture and Scripture of idolatry. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You know who he's referencing. So here we go with the old idea, hey, rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, so then you talk to your seven-year-old kid, hey, you're a rebellion. Do you have a little witchcraft kit in your back room over there? You're acting like a witch. So we start speaking that way to our children. You see, rebellion is as witchcraft. Well, yes, you still have to deal with it. See, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, so we relegate that, of course, as parents or older people to the young people. Oh, we sit over there and watch the teenagers and go, they're just... They're just rebellious and they're just wicked and they're awful people. No, they're not. But they may have a streak of rebellion and going against God. Now, that gives you a perspective for you and me as to the context of how God sees idolatry. So what about the idol of self? You see, the idol of self is what we live in today in our world of the 21st century, which is, of course, course, 2,000 years of us living post-Old Covenant 
What happens when we practice idolatry? The Bible says in Deuteronomy we forget God. It says in Ezekiel that we go, away from, go astray from God. We pollute the name of God. We defile the sanctuary of God. That's the idolatry of the Old Testament. What happens in self? Idolatry? What happens when we have self as our idol? Idolatry, image worship, as we understand it in the Old Testament, is not our problem in premier sin. In fact, today, self-worship is our nemesis. It stands in the way of glory to God. Fair? For me, idol of self is high on my list. Even Colossians 3 tells us to mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And it gives a list of all this stuff, uncleanness and unordinate affection. And it says it's concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. We know. Paul ran into it so much that it bothered him and it stirred him in his heart. Acts 17 says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Athens is only 50, 52, 53 miles from Corinth. He's in this neighborhood of idolatry, and this is, of course, New Testament, but it's Old Testament times. They come to know Jesus Christ. Now they don't have to be so concerned about this old-style idolatry, but we're talking about idol of self. It takes great effort to put away idol of self. From personal experience, I know that. Even Paul the Apostle and his heaviness, how it stirred him, was saying that, hey, I went from Philippi in Acts 16 to Thessalonica, which, hey, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, not that far apart. But then Thessalonica down to Athens in the southern part of the European area there is about 300 miles away. He shows up at Athens, which is right down the street from Corinth, and he is stirred. His spirit was stirred in him because the city was wholly given to idolatry. That was in Paul's second journey. You see, when we look at this idea of how much effort it takes Glory to God takes great effort. It means that I need to flee the idol of self and I need to make worship about him. And I need to start saying those words to myself that really I'm saying to him, God, I want you to receive glory. I'm going to make a better effort at doing so. The second one I want to show you is this. Great effort from God's glory means we must run from self-love and completely depend on God. Isn't that the same as the first one? The idol of self may be in your place of worship, but you may not have self-love. What do I mean? Well, very simply this. You can worship something and just bow down to it, but they may not have a love relationship with it. It's like, I'm going to do what I want when I want to do it. That's having the idol of self. But when you have self-love, when I have self-love, I lose my dependency on God. I love me to supply me with what I need. I love me to get the understanding of the Bible from me. I go off of my own resume and not God's. I start then having this self-love where I'm thinking, I'm not such a bad guy after all. I'm pretty guy. I'm a pretty good guy. I grew up in church, which I did not. I grew up being trained by the best. Okay. But as Paul the Apostle said in Philippians 3, hey, I count all that but loss. We mentioned that last week. Paul the Apostle saying, hey, the idol of self is one thing, but <laughs> self-love is another. Because I get so filled with the idol of self that now I love myself and my sufficiency in myself is more important. Self-love is so very, very, very dangerous and we have someone who is the model of that. This is where I'm going. Isaiah 14, you know what I'm doing here, showing you the example of self-love. Of all the things that come out of this, one of those big things in the root of what Lucifer is saying is that he loves himself. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon, also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. When it moves from idol of self to self-love, it's when you use I a whole lot more than you use they, them, and most of all, him. What happens in my life when I do that? I end up talking about myself more than I talk about the Lord. You say, well, that happens naturally. Oh, I know, I know. I just have to kind of check myself on that. I want people to ask me things so that I can talk about what I have done. See, Lucifer spoke I five times, and it shows how much he loved himself. You see, Paul sees self-love as the chief characteristic of those living in the last days. So he's speaking of the last days way back then when he speaks of it in First and Second Timothy. He said the essence of self-love exists in pride, is it not? The cause of Lucifer's fall in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. I'm better than you, God. I, I would never say that out loud, but I act like I am. I got a few Bible verses that I've memorized. I've looked through my testimony and been saved for a long time. I wonder how much does self-love get in the way of my love for you, Lord? Even in my ministry decisions. I'm free to serve the Lord. I'm free to love him. I'm free from the bondage of sin. I'm free in my liberty in Christ. But the way that I use freedom and relate it to other people is sure to indicate who I love more, myself or him. We did say we're here to do all to the glory of God. In fact, I will bring it up on the screen and just read it. Second Timothy chapter number 3. I put some dot, dot, dots in there too to have up on just one slide. But if you go to 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 5, I will just read the passage of Scripture. It speaks for itself. Some of you know of it. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. And see, you can read through all that and say, oh, well, that's a bunch of other people that I, I'm not that person. Oh, we ought to be careful. As the old phrase go, when I'm pointing one finger at someone else, the three are always pointing back. That's Romans 2.1. That thou art an excusable man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Thou who judgest doest the same things. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God. I've got to check me on this having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. On that other side of this sin problem of self-love comes out, who do I please? I may say that I'm going to please the Lord, but when the Lord has to give an answer of how my testimony is, would he agree with me? It's really, really good stuff to be reminded that we can give glory to God. We can. We ought to. It's a good thing to do so. Last two. Great effort for God's glory means we must edify the brethren. Where do you get that? Here it is. Verse number 23. All things are lawful for me. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful. But all things edify not. I have to look and say, okay, there's got to be some great effort to give God glory by edifying my brothers. But then the other side of edifying my brothers is to uncloud my vision for other people. I'm cloudy when it comes to other people, especially lost people. So the first part is about how I edify my brothers and sisters in the Lord. You're born again today. It is called of us, it is commanded of us to edify one another. But not every, everything edifies. Look at that whole list of things that he puts before you and me and says, hey, 
Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. I need to want somebody else to make more wealth and have more than my wealth. I need to let go of what I have to make sure someone else turns out better than me. Is that the way the world teaches you? See, God puts himself in a place where he says, it will take a lot of effort by my word to give me glory, but it's worth it. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All of it's here for you and for me to partake of according to his will and his way. And he's saying, hey, you and I edify the brethren. Uncloud our vision for others. I should open up my eyes as it says here. Why would someone, verse 30, if by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of by, for that for which I give thanks? I give thanks, I'm sitting at a table, I'm partaking of something, I am free in the Lord Jesus Christ to do that because I want to lead that person to Christ. I want to reach that person for Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, hey, I edify the brethren and I uncloud my vision for other people. It goes to the great commandment. Mark chapter number 12, what does it say? Is it possible that we're missing it all because of this? Or a lot of it maybe, I don't say all, but it says in Mark 12, 28 through 31, and one of the scribes came and having heard from reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered, you know this, the first of all the commandments is. Now is this another passage of scripture that you know and have memorized? Like verse number 31, Whatsoever you do, all to the glory of God, or is it something that's really embedded in your soul? Here, O Israel, as he's speaking to the Jew first, and also to the rest of the audience, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Yeah. God will receive glory out of this. God will receive glory if I just love that way because love never fails. If I love him, love my brethren, and love others because my vision has been unclouded about the lost, the person that needs Jesus Christ, no matter what. Whenever a Christian or whenever a church loses its love and desire to see lost souls come to Jesus Christ in salvation, that entity is in the process of dying a slow, unprofitable, self-centered death. Those are some heavy words of reading and studying this week and this kind of a put together of some things that's just studying from good Bible teachers. I look at that and go, that's good. And it, it's not a condemnation statement. It's a warning. It's a, it's a, hey, everybody, if I as a Christian lose my love and desire to see lost souls come to Jesus, well, it's so hard. No. This is the one place where he's going to get the glory out of it all. You can't steal his glory because he's the one who saved them. He's the one who redeemed them. He's the one who gave this person new life in Jesus. You can't. You may try, oh, I preached the greatest message of the gospel and that's why everybody got saved. Oh, no, no, no. You gave the gospel. Somebody repented and called on the name of the Lord. To God be the glory. That's it right there. But if our church and us, we don't, if I, we would die a slow and unprofitable death. I wouldn't want that. For any of us. And lastly, simple. Great effort for God's glory means that we must increase our conviction. It comes from the last one. It ties together to the last ten verses. We, I personally, must increase my conviction. I have to. I need to consider also to my actions to the lost. I do. I have. Would I drive a few extra miles to go sit with someone that had questions about Jesus? Would I be seen with someone, whoever it may be, in a public place 
for a cup of coffee so that I could answer their questions? Would I increase my conviction so that God would receive glory? Well, it's going to take me extra effort. It's going to take great effort for God to get the glory out of that. But at the end of it all, you and I being messengers, we're just acting like Christ we're acting like Paul, we're acting like Timothy, we're saying despite the idolatry, despite the eating problems, despite the Lord's Supper and the communion problems, despite all the contrary difficulties, the misjudging, the judging of other people, the condemnation of other brothers and sisters in the Lord, I need to look at this thing and say, God, are you really getting any glory out of my life when it comes to giving the gospel? Are my actions to the lost really producing any kind of fruit. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Enter ye and at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. I know this is a Sermon on the Mount. You've already got your dispensational package set. Jesus Christ said this to the crowd, and his disciples were right next to him. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Jesus said it. By the way, Paul said it in his great conviction. He said, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 8. Paul said that. Peter said, hey, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found to the praise and the honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. That I would have this increased conviction. That I would consider that my actions to the lost would show people that I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. He was never ashamed of you or me. Never. He gave glory to his Father in everything that he did. The Word of God is not asking anything out of us that he did not. Jesus himself fulfill. We're commanded not to be ashamed. Whosoever who believe in him shall not be ashamed, it says in Romans. A true witness delivers souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. Paul knew of the consequences of someone who was lost, they would go to hell. And maybe all of you that are born again today, you know of someone that you knew who's passed away. And you don't know if they're saved or lost. Paul knew the consequences, he knew the command, he knew all the circumstances of everything, and he, he said, hey, just as Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount, I say to you, for the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what we ought to do. When the lost are no longer sought, when Christian love and desire deteriorate, the church ceases to function. We lose our purpose. I'll lose my purpose. How can God get glory out of? We do an incredible amount of God glorifying things, and I thank you for that. Ministering with you and ministering for you and shepherding you, I say it as much as I can. It is an honor and a joy. But I ask myself, will my testimony help turn people to Jesus or turn them away? Because if they're turned to Jesus, he gets the glory out of it all. And it's going to take a lot of effort for me and you to pass out the gospel that way. Not by a gospel track, but by our life and our words and our actions to the lost. God's warnings must drive us to a greater effort. They ought to. Just like when someone says to you at work, you need to do a better job or you're going to get fired. <laughs> See, God doesn't fire us. We're still in with Jesus. If you're born again today, he's not going to fire you. He's just saying that my warnings need to drive you to a greater effort, Mark Brown. 
church. Why? To do all to the glory of God. May our prayer be this morning this, that we would ask the Lord to give us an outward focus for our brethren. Everything outward. And for lost souls. My brothers, to see you more than I see me after I see Jesus. Lost souls, that I would see the lost souls with a clear vision after I see the Lord and my brothers, then them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we finish out. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just ask you today, maybe you're lost and you, you just have unclear vision about life and you'd like to be saved today, you'd like to be born again, I offer this to you. After church service, I'll sit right up front here, and if you just wait, I'll wait, and I'll sit down and show you scripture and answer any question that you have about Jesus, about salvation. And for you believers, this morning I ask you again, what kind of effort are we putting in? Because it takes a great effort to give God glory. May your prayer be today, God, Lord, show me a need to see the brethren and my lost souls, friends that are in my life. Father, thank you for this time of invitation. Thank you for this time of prayer in Jesus' name. Have your way in our hearts and our lives. We need you. And Father, may you find us responsive to the accountability and responsibility we have it's a beautiful thing to give you glory in all that we do in Jesus' name. Please stand, if you would.